Hello and welcome. My name is Wes Ward from Govern With. This is part of our Governance Masterclass series, today's webinar, where for the next 12 months, we will be focusing on all the contemporary governance risks that our directors and our data sets are telling us. And today, as advertised, we're going to be talking about the climate risks and how they can uh, affect your strategic plan. And of course, it's, we've got a full pack show today, so we won't hesitate too long because we've got uh, Neil Plummer, a climate expert, and of course, we've got uh, Fee Mercer, our governance expert on the call. So I know we've got a lot to cover today. So what we'll do just to get started is we're finding at the moment, and I did mention this in our previous webinar, that a lot of people are enjoying the content of, of what we produce in governance, but they don't actually know what we do. So at Govern With, we actually have our flagship product called Boardroom Plus. And what it is best practice in governance review, being a board governance review, director skills matrix, director development, and board succession management. And of course, we are the leaders because we have assessed in those two assessments, 71 uh, governance risks across three categories of risks, them being the traditional corporate professional, our con contemporary risks, such as climate risk, as we're doing today, and sector specific for our nonprofit friends in the uh, health, human services, aged care, uh, communities and education sectors. And of course, we do board succession management is a key capability of what Boardroom Plus can actually do. A little bit about the data and our background. We've been in the game for 10 years. We've, in the last six months, had over 7,000 director contributions to the data platform across 700 boards. The impact that we're having out in the not-for-profit communities that we are serving, who serve, serve those communities, is in excess of 10 billion, an employee base of over 50,000 and a volunteer base of over 30,000. So we like to think that we're small enough to care, but big enough to make a difference. These are the five sectors in the not-for-profit sector that we serve. That's health, human services, aged care, and education and communities. Our partners are Aon Insurance, the Global Insurer, the Victorian Healthcare Association, Governance Institute of Australia, ACPA, the leading authority, in aged care, women on boards, and of course, convene the board administration portal technical partner. Just a few, a quick snapshot of some of the firms, not everyone's not an exhaustive list of everyone we work with today. So at the end of this, I hope you start to feel assured, especially if you have a demonstration with us, that you will be assured as a director that Boardroom Plus is Australian governance best practice when it comes to board governance review, director capability development and board succession management for those highly regulated not-for-profit organizations that I just touched on. So that's what we do. Our remit and goal is to create high functioning boards, but that's enough about us. Now it's time to talk a little bit about our guests and the topic for today being the climate risks and how it can impact your strategic plan and your next governance cycle over the next three to five years. So the agenda today is one, understanding sector specific climate risks, developing resilient strategies and collaborating for impact. We wanna make sure you've got tangible, practical takeaways that you can implement now, or at least start a conversation at board level within your organization. Today, I'm very honored and excited to present our climate guest speaker today. His name is Neil Plummer, a climate expert based in Geelong and a leader at Out of the Box Executive. I'm not going to talk about your credentials, your expertise and background. What I'm going to do, Neil, is throw to you and welcome you to today's webinar. Thanks very much, uh, Wes. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which I am here today. Pay my respects to the elders past and present, and I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, present uh, today. Right, so the mid-1980s, I started with the Bureau of Meteorology as a weather forecaster. I got really interested in, in climate after a couple of years of being there. So by the late 1980s, I was asked to work on um, some climate change uh, projects. I had 33 years in the Bureau of Meteorology, jobs, as I said, in clim climate change, in data management and for uh, water forecasting. Uh, but also probably one of my most biggest highlights was supporting Pacific Island countries. They're the most uh, vulnerable to weather and climate 
extreme. So I spent a lot of time doing that. In 2019, I retired from the Bureau of Meteorology. I gave myself three months to decide uh, what to do next. I joined my wife's company, my wife, Joe Plummer, in out-of-the-box executive. So that was mostly around supporting organizations in strategy, in governance and business planning. But I found it impossible to turn away from climate. So much going on. So part of my work is helping all organizations uh, manage the, the risks with climate change, but also capture those opportunities we're seeing from, in, in particular, from the energy transition. I always knew there'd be plenty to do in this space, and that's become, become true. And uh, yeah, just delighted to, to be here and, and talk about one of my favorite topics. Thanks, Wes. Well, we're delighted to have you, Neil. So thank you so much for your participation today and all the data that you've been pouring into this presentation. There's a lot of takeaways here. Of course, it wouldn't be a governor with webinar if Fee Mercer wasn't involved, the governance guru, our mentor and CEO. Fee, welcome to the show. I know you're actually on the move at the moment. You've dialed in from Sydney, I believe. Wes, thank you so much for having us today. And I guess everybody... Uh, pretty much knows my background and just basically for the last 10 years I'm just a bit like you Neil just have an absolute passion for making a difference but my difference is with boards and giving them access to what they need to be the best they can and so that's why we're here today to talk about what some of our data has shown us. Absolutely. Thank you, Fee. Well, without further ado, let's start to get into the brass tacks. And this slide is always a really good slide. We used it a lot during our cyber series because we found two core contemporary governance risk categories being cyber and ESG were really low when it came across our entire data set of directed data. Fee, can you help us out and start to unpack what this means in terms of the risks to boards, their plans and what we're seeing right now? Exactly, Wes. Well, what this means is that environmental social governance has a lot of questions when we ask the individual director about their skills that relate to climate, but actually broader than climate, Wes, about the environment, full stop, and about their understanding of our commitment as an organisation from a board perspective to manage any of those risks and what have you got in place and what's your experience and we came, we were actually quite surprised it's actually quite low on the register as a skill for directors. So what does this mean? What it means, Wes, is that when we talk about environmental issues or we're still don't talk about environmental issues at the boardroom table, if you don't have experience in this, you actually don't know the right questions to ask and you often uh, don't know what information you require to make good decisions about managing this risk. Wonderful. All right. So obviously what this slide is saying that ESG is a disproportionate impact in terms of all the risks that we're assessing right now. Yes, exactly. And we were just asked a question, does this mean 39.71% feel that they do have this skill? Yes. That's what this means. So it means that there's a significant proportion of directors who don't feel comfortable that this is a strong skill set of theirs. Thank you for that fee. Okay, quick poll, pop quiz right now. We will be talking through the results at the end of today's presentation. How can the climate data, how, how is it going to impact your organisation's strategic plan? As a director, you've got to start thinking about all the top risks, whether they're disproportional or marginal to your strategic plan. So that's what we're doing here today. Uh, Neil, we're going to talk about the warming data, the facts, the data, before we talk about the implications, which is really the topic of today. But we've got four very impactful slides, and you're the expert with 33 years at the Bureau. Help us unpack the next four slides, and let's talk to start here. Yeah, well, prob probably no surprise when it comes to climate change and or, or global warming um, that increases in temperature is a feature of not just Australia's climate, but of countries all around the world. And I'm sure uh, you would have seen in the news over the past few weeks just what's happening in, in Europe, in, in the US, in North Africa, and in, in, in China, just the extreme heat waves and bushfires they're having. So it's no coincidence here that we're seeing 
and not just increasing in temperatures, but an in increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme temperatures. So this is a measure, it's data from the Bureau of Meteorology. It gives the number of days Australian temperatures were in the warmest 1% of, of records. It's a little bit complex to, to unpack. I could have shown a number of other measures which would give a similar message here. The takeaway from here is if you compare just how the frequency of these extremes were in the earlier part of the 20th century, compared to what we've had over the last 20 years or so, there's been this massive uh, ma massive increase. And no matter how we unpack the data, that's, that, that's, that signal, signal merges. And if you look around the world, you would, you, you, you would see similar, uh, similar graphs. So, so there's no doubt here in terms of what we're seeing in historical trends. And it's very likely that those trends are going to continue in the future. Thanks, Wes. Neil, based on the pre-work before this webinar, when we're talking about extremes, and just correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, we're talking about the 1% or the 99% per percentile. So when you're talking about what is defined as extreme, we're talking about the that top 1% historically. Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so we saw, uh, as this graph shows, we saw, uh, we saw very few of those one percent record events early in the century yeah. but we're now seeing them uh, much more frequently yeah because you know our family farm's 135 years old we we've seen a lot of fires flood drought everything like that and even personally i remember working in a shearing shed and it was 48 degrees so a lot of people would say well there's been drought fire and famine since the millennium you know since time immemorial but what we're going to see over these four um, slides is that top extremeness is the frequency, and that's what we've got to get wrap our heads around. That's right. That's right, Wes. Yeah. Okay. Well, actuaries, this is really important. I love this because they're their step between the Bureau research data and commercial reality with the insurers, and we've been talking with the insurers at Aon Insurance, and they write products to mitigate the risk of climate and they're not in the business of losing money either. So this is really what I'd call commercial data to really underscore the point. So thank you. I'd love to hear all about it. Yeah, th th thanks, Wes. You give the background very clearly here. Groups like Australian Actuaries are interested in this because these changes in extremes have the greatest impact on people and on the economy. And similar comments apply uh, to the insurance industry. So really interesting that we're getting these other groups taking uh, climate data uh, and putting it in a context that really matters to them um, and, and to their clients. So this index, uh, it's a combination of extreme high and low temperatures, heavy precipitation, dry days, strong wind and changes in, in sea level. And just as you said before, it concentrates on the top 1% of, okay. of events. And sure, sure enough, you get a similar trends to what we've seen in other other climate cl climate in indicators. So I could have shown a, a similar graph of the actual cost to in, in insurers, and you'd see this upward upward trend. So consistent with what we're seeing in the underlying climate data, we're seeing this bigger bigger impact on people and on the economy. Absolutely. And for everyone who's unaware, we do have a 30 minute webinar with Aon Insurance on climate sitting at governwith.com forward slash webinars. Check it out. We've got all the insurance data around climate there from one of their gurus. Let's talk about the bushfire index, uh, Neil. Yeah, this is this is really important for Australia. We're one of the more uh, bushfire prone countries in, in, in the world. Again, this is based on historical Data so effectively taking the data, uh, the same data that went into the previous uh, the previous graph we saw. Where does that data go now? Oh, this would uh, this particular data goes back to the early nineteen fifties, I I believe. So we're actually seeing, and it wouldn't matter if we took the data back to the start of the nineteen hundreds; it would show a similar a similar pattern. But what it shows is that there has been an increase in the number of da dangerous fire uh, weather days over a good part of the of the country and, and only declines in real sort of um, uh, uh, patchy areas. And this is a consequence of 
A, the warming trend we've seen, so things are getting hotter. The fact that, the fact that over large parts of Australia, we've seen reducing rainfall, so longer periods of dry, um, uh, dr dry weather. And yeah, just that, that combined, the combination of those two things leading to more dangerous fire weather. That's historical data. Look at the, the climate models going forward. Those trends likely to very likely to increase and saw this risk increasing in the future too. So this is once again talking to that upper 1% in, in this or it's just aggregate numbers of days above 46 or whatever. What, what is an extreme day? Yeah, this is so extreme fire weather. It's based on a an index of temperature of rainfall plus plus the, the forest fuel. So it's a combined index, but you're right here, it is looking at the extremes and it's either the, the top 1% or the top 5% uh, okay. for this particular graph. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. And once again, referring to the Aon webinar, they've predicted the fuel loads already and they forecast that uh, the fuel loads that got burnt in the previous round of bushfires, we had 20 years fuel load. They're predicting that three years of rain have got them nearly to that equivalent. We don't need to wait 17 years to get the equivalent fuel load. It's just about there already. It'll be wet. It won't be dry, but it's there. And this is a really important slide here, Neil, talking about how climate's a risk multiplier. Talk to us about that. What does that mean? Yeah, well, well on here, Wes, we've got some of the trends which I've talked about before in terms of the, the warming, the more heat waves. We've also seen those signal in the ocean, which is of real concern in terms of marine, marine animals, the fish, the ecosystems, the coral reefs, and so forth under, under threat. But we've also got other extremes like changes we're seeing in, in, in tropical, tropical cyclones. Another I haven't mentioned so far was intense rainfall events likely to become more extreme. In the bottom right there, you see not just the more dangerous fire weather, but what we are seeing is the longer fire seasons, that trend towards a longer, a longer fire season. What's most interesting about these things is, is A, the frequency and intensity of these several extremes are increasing. The return periods of these events are happening, happening faster. But it's actually the coincidence of these events, the over, potentially overlapping of these events which just lifts, uh, lifts the impacts of those extremes even higher. The World Economic Forum sees uh, climate change as the world's greatest risk because not just because it's happening in isolated regions, but it's happening all over the world. Thank you for that. All right, now we're actually getting into what we're talking about. That was the precursor. And I'm mindful of time. So if I interrupt you, it's because the little bell's ringing in the back of my head. Okay. Now, now, if we look at climate change risk, okay, and now we've got to talk to our audience of directors, chairs, executives who are on the call today, how can it impact your organization's strategic plan? We all know from a governance perspective that everyone's got a strategic plan and, and it's the board's role from a governance perspective to make sure what risks are going to impact that plan or impede and what needs to happen from a mitigation point of view. So let's talk about from a not-for-profit sector specific angle. Let's talk about, we've got five of them right now. Let's talk about the governance risks fee. And I've created this little sort of formula, the situation, what it looks like right now, what we've got, but then how does it impact what we'd call a traditional governance risk? Just so we can sort of uh, mold together this contemporary risk issue of climate, how it's going to impact other areas of your risk matrix and, and talk through that. And really the energy transitions underway fee, um, how long it finishes, uh, when it finishes, I'll ask Neil about, um, but high energy prices is what everyone's dealing with, including hospitals and aged cares. Exactly, Wes. So what this means at a board level is you've got that traditional risk of worrying nonstop about finance, but guess what? You have to add this to the top of the list is the cost, it, it won't just be to our communities, it will be to those of us who are providers as well. Mm -hmm. The cost of our actual power, 
all of those resources that enable us to run. And I think also, you know, you look at the dedicated service delivery and the capital works programs that would have been planned in that strategic cycle, the growth of, you know, the demand for health services, et cetera, mm. that budget's going to get chewed up just by increased costs. Neil, um, talking about the time frame of this transition, because it, it's really ugly and bumpy right now, and, and no one's ha- in Australia is very happy about it from the households to business because it is just growing and growing, the energy cost. Yeah, that's a real problem. Where's one of one of many cost of living problems mm. that we've that we've seen. Look, en- energy prices have gone up a, a lot. Electricity and gas they're also very volatile. They've been jumping around a lot for a lot, and that's going to continue. The one of the clear things that will bring prices down is a transition um, to renewables. As you said, it won't be it won't, won't be smooth. We've got a lot of work to do in a short, short space of time, but just about all governments and the state governments in, in, in Australia and the national government have got these targets to 2030, 20, 2050 and so forth to reduce emissions, to bring in more re- renewables. And so there is an acceleration happening. There are things that not-for-profits from small businesses can do to transition to clean energy because there are incentives now being offered by governments and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that later well it's coming up on the show that's absolutely correct the second governance risk let's talk about the more fre- the frequency of these heat waves the intensity which you spoke about in the data there neil the negative outcome for some of our constituents is increased as the elderly you know it's, it's an unfortunate reality but this just cascades through the whole organization including traditional risk yeah, and it's another one of these um, co- compounding ones. So the one, the ones affected are the most uh, vulnerable. We've also got a, we've got a cry with, with the high energy prices. We've got people actually not switching on heating, and probably in summer not switching on uh, yeah. cooling if they've got it at all. So, particularly as we're rolling into spring, summer, and the likelihood of a potentially hot summer, there some real concerns for those vulnerable people, those in HK homes, and of course, those in homes that haven't got the insulation, that haven't got the access to, to, to cooling. And of all the natural hazards, this is the biggest killer in, in Australia, heat waves. Uh, Fee, and you can see that, you know, this directly impacts industry sector specific governance issues, such as clinical, being service delivery, and even in aged care, you know, you know, let's just quickly touch on that, because, you know, everyone's got a duty of care. Absolutely. So what this means at the boardroom table is that we have to broaden the scope of the risks that we look at that will impact on our community, our clients, but our staff. You know, you've got to think broader than just the people we look after. It's the people who look after the people. Uh, Our staff are impacted by these profoundly as well and if you translate that from health and it's the do no harm to our clients and our staff but if you translate it into education for example Wes it's all about the safety and the well-being of our students you can't let students outside in this sort of catastrophic heat waves there are all sorts of flow-on issues for all of the sectors that we work with. And it can look like, you know, increased demand for emergency services, you know, be greater demands on hospital staff and educators alike. You know, there's always those trickle down effects. Governance risk number three, talking about organisation. I did want to make sure that we covered not only direct impact ones, but slightly indirect impacts as well. As a governance professional, you're sitting on the board and we know from our data fee that workforce is one of the greatest risks to uh, the strategic plan, attraction and retention. Mm. But if your an organisation's not leading on it, you've got to look not only at your workforce, but the uh, stakeholders. Just let's talk about this. Yes, exactly. So what it means if you're not absolutely proactive and um, leading on a culture that actually cares not just about climate change, but about our environmental footprint, our responsible behaviour around this, and It needs to be led by the board and be seen to be led. And the executive, it does not 
speak well to our staff and it does not speak well to those who are we're trying to attract in a recruitment way to our teams. Neil, you consult a lot on uh, matters climate. Have, have you noticed, any, at least anecdotally, yeah, the the firms that you work with uh, are they outperforming potential laggards in terms of that brand appeal, that workforce attraction? Have you noticed any difference, or is there a greater culture and a vibe going within the internal uh, machinations? Oh, definitely. Where it's on every risk, there's also an opportunity here. So a lot of organisations are seeing the opportunity to do what their community, their customers, and their communities want to see. Done in terms of reducing impact on the uh, environment, reducing uh, carbon emissions. So it's very much a, a reputational issue here. I'm saying just a, a, a quick example here is I had contact from a, a small food manufacturer in, in Victoria about wanting to know more about uh, climate and unpacking why that was the case. It was because in their supply chain with Coles, Woolworths and Aldi and so forth, they were doing major things. On, on climate action, their expectation was that others in the supply chain would do, would do the same. Absolutely. That will just happen more and more often. If we look at governance risk number four, and once again, I wanted to highlight another indirect outcome of uh, you know bushfires. And th this actually came out of Aon because they're paying for all the recovery of these things. <laughs> But, you know, a lot of people think about the regions when it comes to climate events. You know, we've seen it with the floods, with the bushfires. They tend to impact our regional partners out there. But here is in the middle of uh, Sydney was the bushfire smoke coming in. It was actually overworking the air conditioning systems. It was actually degrading those systems. And so from a governance risk point of view, Fee, I'd, I'd sort of consider it impacting a more traditional area in asset mass management and infrastructure. Yes, exactly. So with, yet again, um, you can be hearing about fires in other regions, but the flow of the smoke can directly impact on a very large uh, environment way hundreds of miles down the track. And you're absolutely right, Wes, it has a long-term impact on not only the supply chains and delivery of... I was going to add to that, Fee, is that our family backgrounds in vineyards and winemaking, and I know smoke tank just, you know, gets sucked through the leaves. That's the end of the crop. So it's that similarities there. It affects all sectors. It makes it tougher working conditions for staff and employees. Yeah. But if you look at patients and student safety, again, a hotter environment is not good for anyone. Um, You're right. I was just going to add that importance at the boardroom table of thinking beyond your own community with some of these things. We tend to think just the radius of our community, but what climate change that I've learned about was, is the actual ability to think way beyond what you can see and who you know. Well, you've got to start thinking of the broader community, the national community, not just our own little place, beautiful place where we live. Governance risk number five, flooding events. We've had a lot of clients fee, especially when I first came to govern with, that were great, greatly affected by the floods, all those communities along the river, all the way through to South Australia and Victoria. The new cycle moves on. You know, it's a long time ago, but the mental health issues are still there. Let's talk about that from, you know, you, your background is in health as well as governance. Let's talk about that. And then we, I'll defer to you, Neil. Yes, so it's that classic response to disaster. You know, the first thing is, make sure everybody's safe. The second thing is look after the injured and everybody immediately. But the long-term thing that we have to think about at the boardroom table now is the long-term impact on our communities. And it's not just floods, it's also fires. And we hear so many stories of houses still not built, money still not filtered down, and the mental health impact is profound. And again, that's our communities and our own staff. Absolutely. And of course, and I'll talk to you about this now, you know, as the supply chains, you know, you've got roads cut off, you've got bridges washed out, there's hospitals that can't get critical medicines. You would have seen quite a few examples of this. Yeah, I have. Um, so, certainly, where's the, 
um, at supply chains. Um, and it was, you know, there, there was a big focus on uh, floods over the East Coast um, uh, earlier in the year and, and, and la la last year. But there was also had them in Northern Territory and Western Australia where it was really cut off from, from food supplies to towns. What comes to mind in this one for me is just think about some of those communities, particularly in the eastern New South Wales, who felt the flood, the full impact from the floods. Some of those sort, same communities experienced years of drought, a heat wave, bushfire, floods, some of the floods multiple times, and then COVID. Mm. So, in terms of the mental health, Mm. It's no surprise whatsoever just to see, you know, that increase in demand for mental health services, not just in those regions, because it doesn't just affect those communities, but many communities around. around. Yeah, I, think, I think you raise a really good point there, Neil. It's, you know, we're just talking about the impacts of a singular risk category being climate. But if you put in a different one, like a pandemic, and they collide, then you've got a real problem. So uh, thank you for that. We've really got to get our skates on and move along because we're still in section one. Now we're at section two of three. Okay, now let's talk about uh, building resilience. You know, we've talked about the problems, the impacts, the data is telling us what we're, we're in for and we've got the evidence of what's happening as a result. But let's uh, get on the front foot. You know, everyone who's here today is proactive. That's why they are here. And um, let's talk about, you know, resilient strategies. And I've just broken them down you know, one by one line item. But the first one that came to mind for me, Neil, was that, you know, my concept or the way I express is decoupling from the grid. So you reduce your exposure to volatile prices by investing in infrastructure such as solar, wind, or any other, you know, modes that you could think of. Yeah, and that that's true, Wes. But also, also by um, converting over into electricity compared to to, to gas, because the, the the grid is becoming um, more and more uh, focused on renewables all the time uh, than the old coal and um, and, and, and gas. So, um, you know, um, as far as possible, go over to electric uh, electric and yeah, get those panels uh, on on the roof if you can afford it. Uh, batteries. And, yeah. and that's which once again are going to reduce that finance risk exposure um strategy number two fee we've sort of touched on it already but you know i, I use flood affected for mental health but once again it's the planning and the discussions at border just from a governance point of view not an executive execution point of view what's the approaches here to, to generate that resilience mm, exactly number one we've got really good board subcommittees. We need an integration of those committees to discuss such complex topics such as this. You need that finance, that risk and audit combined with your sustainability committees and your quality committees to discuss this together because it's a reallocation of resources and you need to have a damn good reason why you're doing that. The other um, really important thing was, and we're gonna talk about this a bit more, is partnerships. And there's been a fabulous question in our uh, line of questions about who is responsible for not just the emergency, we know pretty much who's responsible for that, but who's responsible for the follow-up bit. And we're going to talk more about that. I will move on to uh, the next one. And, and it's really, this was born of a conversation with our friends at Aon, uh, Neil, where in particular, the schools and education sector, you know, infrastructure is a big play. You're going to open up a new campus. You're going to upgrade facilities, all that sort of stuff. You know, it's not just the heating and the cooling, but it's capital works programs. Where are you going to build in light of? So I was trying to cover two things in this slide in terms of, you know, the income sort of expense column, but the capital works being, you know, are you going to set up a brand new gym and gymnasium and school uh, swimming centre on a floodplain or, or somewhere where you're going to be risk exposure? You would have had a lot of uh, consultancies around this. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of organisations looking at this closely, what their, uh, what their risk exposure is at present, how they can mitigate that risk. And for some organisations, it might mean relocating. 
you look at those riverine areas in New South Wales, I mentioned earlier, they will get future future floods and they may be more extreme than even the ones we've we've had. So that huge adaptation, risk mitigation, that's got to be a focus now for a lot of organisations. Absolutely. And once again, I refer to Aon Data. They predicted the Lismore floods to the property with a 96% accuracy before it happened. Right. So there's people, there's experts with the data right now that you can consult. And we'll get onto that in a moment. And that's where we get into stage three about the collaboration opportunities. There's no point us talking about the problems and more problems and the impacts of the problems and then showing some solutions with some way of doing it because we know that a lot of our audience, you know, resourcing is a challenge. So the only way forward in many cases is to collaborate and we try to help as much as possible on that. But if we talk about some of the benefits of collaboration before we demonstrate some examples, Neil, talk us through this uh, slide about the benefits of collaborating on climate. Yeah, well, well the key one is to, uh, for, for, for boards is to improve your, your governance and your, uh, and your strategy. And bear in mind that many organisations have been through this journey uh, before. Some will be, will be ahead. And there is the potential to, because of that, access more effective and potentially lower cost uh, solutions. And I've given some examples in, in that slide. But have a look at those organizations nearby that have got, because they've got similar problems when it comes to climate change and the challenges of emissions reductions. Look for those potential partners in health, but in other sectors. And, and, and I use water as an example because... Water has be, been dealing in uh, climate risks for decades uh, now, and they've, um, they've got some really good risk mitigation capability. Yeah, you're referring to water boards and, and, you know, those statutory authorities that we have here, at least in Victoria, probably across Australia. Yeah. Yep. Great. Well, uh, we will get to that because it's down the track in our slides. But Fee... You know, this is a really interesting slide here, how we can start thinking from a board point of view, the appointments. And, you know, as we always say, the next five years of your strategic plan, you've got to have a, an exec and a board team that's got the skills and capabilities to execute the next five years, not necessarily the last five years. If this is a foreseeable risk, it might make sense to start bringing some of this expertise onto the board. Yeah, what this means is, is that we need to have this expertise at the table when these discussions happen. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, if it's not possible to have those skills in your actual director, you can bring them on to your board subcommittees and they can speak to your risk and audit committees and that information can come back up to the board. They can be guests at your planning days. But my best advice is you actually need to know what do you look like at the moment? What do you already have in place? What are the skills of those sitting around the table? And then look at those gaps and then go, okay, what are our choices? But be prepared to be non-traditional in who you have sitting around the table because it will save you hours of discussion having experts in these particular areas. And you might be surprised, I, I think, Fee, you may have seen it in our data. Sometimes the expectation is there's no skill or capability, but until you do a comprehensive assessment and then all of a sudden you realise you've got someone on your team already, you don't have to go and recruit for or develop for, but until a chair or a company secretary or a CEO knows, is aware that's there. Now, we want to talk about the non-traditional. We did touch on Water Corporation. I think this is a really exciting slide. Uh, Neil, you're going to help us out here because you led on this during preparation, non-traditional approaches and what they're looking like right now. Yeah, I, I mentioned the Water Corporations before. They're key, not just in understanding the waterways, which is which is really important, but, all, but, but also their path towards reducing carbon emissions, transition to renewables, of which they partner with many organizations with which to do those things. And as I said before, they're sort of leading in this area. The traditional traditional owners here, yeah, good one here, cultural burning plans. And of, of the fires we had 
2019, 2020, one of the key recommendations from the Royal Commission that followed that was to, to capture this, this traditional knowledge and, and that the valuable way of doing things, things differently. So the strong relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities working together on strategic projects and, and business partnerships. I know there are some boards around that now have Aboriginal people on their boards and they're already um, give, given extreme value to those organisations. I love it. I love it. And of course, local councils, fee they spend a lot of money already doing a lot of these things. You know, we can certainly access a lot of that data. They, it's, you know, IP that our customer base could use to help break the bank of a lot of that expensive applications, I think. Exactly. So one of our key roles, and interestingly, one of the top areas that our board reviews have highlighted, Wes, is um, a low score around key stakeholder engagement. And so a lot of boards are going back out and going, who are our most important key stakeholders? And we are looking very non-traditionally at who we need to work with in order to even understand this risk. Who do we have around the table? And working with local government is absolutely essential. And there were some brilliant examples of those partnerships during COVID where in a heartbeat on local football ovals, entire testing stations were set up. So we can do it, but let's not think about it just because there was an emergency. Let's think about it and be proactive. Love it. Thank you. And of course, the obvious collaboration is there's a lot of experts out there. And, you know, I've sort of deferred to Aon because I've got personal experience with their expertise. Their modeling is incredible. And it's not just Aon, there's plenty out there. I'm, I'm not advocating just for them. I, I, I'm advocating that there's a lot of work already being done in that space and they're pricing risk as a commercial product. Neil, let's talk about that, but also the different types of experts, because it is a broad church to a degree, and it could be overwhelming to anyone in our audience. Let's break it down what our audience could be looking for to get the, the best practice there. Sure, sure Wes. And uh, I'd like to amplify what you said, that there's an enormous amount of information already out, out there, work done on, 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 on risks. And for your audience, um, I'm very happy to point them towards work that will be done in their area. And then that's a great place to, to start. We don't want to reinvent the wheel here. You might find that um, a lot of the work's already been done, so you don't have to engage um, in, in any expertise. Uh, but in, in my field, particularly those who are, we say climate risk management, but this is all about taking the perspective from the organization. Every organization is different here. Um, and I think a mistake probably that I certainly I made earlier in my career was to take it from a top-down climate uh, focus here, whereas it's actually bottom up. What really matters materially for the organization mm. and then what climate-related risks are actually important in that context. But we can bring in the modeling, the projections. Scenario development is really, really important because we don't know exactly how that future is going to plan out, especially when we're talking about decades ahead. Uh, but what we can do is present a number of different scenarios with which to explore your risks. And do you think, Neil, you know, even prior to talking to the experts, you could probably access some completed work at a local government le a level just to get the conversation started at board level, go, this is what you know, this organisation believes best practice, start to understand the frameworks, the language, how to talk about it, and, you know, identify, is that one way of getting started? Definitely, yeah, I'd certainly advocate for that. And, and, and also what Fee, Fee, Fee said in um, previous comment, you know, assess your current understanding and, and, and knowledge of, of the situation. Great place to start. And that's Look, what Neil, I 100% support that because when we do our... Uh, governance reviews and under risk we now have the contemporary questions and we talk about environmental and social governance and the board are marking themselves down but what we say is ask your CEO and your executive to give you a presentation on what you're already doing because nine times out of ten the organizations are doing fabulous things 
but there's this lack of knowledge between the groups and then the board can lead on, well, who should be our stakeholders around this? So it's a really uh, simple and important strategy. Really good point there, Faye. And of course, that's what Boardroom Plus does, as you can see right there, is board review and director skills assessments. So thank you very much for that. Now, where does climate sit in governance fee? Mm. You know, is yeah. it something it is? Is it the risk? Let, let's talk to this because it's ultra important before we talk about the uh, poll results. It's like all things with that are now top risks. It mm. sits everywhere from a governance perspective. It sits, it needs to be discussed in your strategy. There needs to be the words, just like, you know, not doing any harm to patients, clinical governance needs to sit in your the words and the words around our management of this needs to sit in our strategy. It, it's not just to sit in the risk register, it could get lost in there. And even if it's a far away risk, it, it needs to be discussed now because it's a foreseen risk. It needs to be an agenda on our an agenda item at our boardroom table. Whether we like it or not, it's here. And so we do need to discuss it. And as directors, we need to be curious about it. We're not saying we have the answers, but we need you to be curious about this. Forget about whether it's here or not. We need to be curious about it. Whether or not it sits in our audit and risk committee, you need to decide where it sits. Mm -hmm. And some organisations have committees such as sustainable committees and it sits in there. But whereas it needs to be everywhere because it needs to be something that we're always thinking about. Thank you for that. Uh, what we might do right now is uh, we're just going to share the results and Fee, I might get you to talk to the results. I'm not sure if you can see them right now, but the question was, are climate risks included in your risk register? 39, nearly 40% said yes. In your experience, Neil, is, is that upper or lower? Do you know? That looks above average to me. Yeah, well, we've got a very progressive audience. You know, they are on board with Govern With and we try to forward lean. So that's really good. 36% no and 24% unsure. So hopefully the next couple of slides might be able to start that conversation in terms of resources and help that. And thank you to Neil for pulling them together. But if we just quickly in 30 seconds run through what we're talking about here, Neil, on the left-hand column before we talk about Geelong sustainability and what you do. Yeah, sure. So the top left there, incorporating climate risk and opportunities into your governance directly. There's a link there from the AICD. A lot of work done on climate change and health. The Climate and Health Alliance is the first link. Doctors for the Environment or it is the second link. And the Climate Council has got some excellent information too. Climate Adaptation for Health. The Victorian state government and other state governments have put out adaptation plans in recent years. There's an example from Victoria. And I couldn't get away without having one of my previous organisation, Bureau of Metrology, some work they did in collaboration with the CSIRO on state of the climate. It's updated every two years, the last one, 2022. So there's a link. We, we do risks. We do work within Out of the Box Executive on assisting organisations responding to climate risks and also capturing the opportunities that we know are out, out there. Geelong Sustainability. So I'm uh, a volunteer on the board of Geelong Sustainability, which is a, a, a not-for-profit. They have a number of excellent uh, programs in place, which provides not-for-profits with funding to get renewables, to get improved energy efficiencies, and so forth. And those not-for-profits, if they don't have the if they don't have the finances to meet the upfront costs, there, then they pay back those costs through the savings they make in energy over the years ahead. So really good. Have programs around electrifying homes and a number of other programs too. Yeah, sure. Obviously, we've just spoken about you. Your contact details will be in the replay for anyone keen to catch up with Neil. I've taken the liberty of including your uh, LinkedIn profile. So feel free to reach out to Neil. But also, if you want governance help and talking about Boardroom Plus, Fee and Neil, which is fabulous because normally 
you know, I like to talk and I love talking with guests and it might run over because we get the good stuff. 